Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming and uh, welcome in Moscow. I yeah, thanks for coming and uh, welcome in Moscow. The majority here. Who is who is Russian and who is foreign? Can we ask that? Like, who's Russian? Ran hands, please. Okay, cool. So we should. Yeah. Well, we don't all know Russian here. No, dobro utro. And who's foreign? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> all right. Okay. Very cool. We have a, a lot to discuss. We have quite some time. And um, I think the best would be to first start a bit about who we are here and then a bit about the topics. So Liz and I, are, we are uh, moderating this session. OK. OK, now I have to watch what I say, right? <laughs> so, so Liz, why don't you uh, ladies first start with something about you and then Paulina, and then we guys follow with who we are. Great. Uh, well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I uh, sort of asked to, to, to fill in here as a, as a moderator and talk about some of the trends that we're seeing in fast fashion and in how we bring customers to our brands and some of the trends that we're seeing. And we've got a lot of great experts here. Um, I think we also kind of wanted to know how many people in this room like have their own business or yeah, have their own, okay, great. And how many people are in retail, commerce, fashion? <laughs> Something that might be related, okay, close enough. Um, so ask who wants to be in <laughs> yeah, right, commerce. Right, really, right, exactly. Are you guys hiring? Because there might be some people looking for, yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, Paulina has a, uh, a, a business that she's gonna tell us a little bit about. Um, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself first and kind of how you got started uh, in okay. this industry. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you hear me? It's okay. So, I'm going to speak Russian because I think that most I will speak Russian because uh, the audience is mostly Russian. I'm Paulina Goncher and I'm a PR director of Transbrand. That's true. The owner of the business is not now in Moscow, so I'll be representing her here today and our story. Uh, so we are not old enough, and so we are very happy to be here. So it's because uh, uh, maybe uh, we are, we do not have a standard marketing and PR strategy. So Transbrands uh, is a young, uh, very successful business in e-commerce, and uh, we have also three st uh, three stores. We opened two. 0.5 years ago in June 2011, and we launched our website at the same time in an offline uh, store in um, the department store Svitnoy. We didn't have a much budget. We thought that an offline store would be a great support to our online store. Now we have already three shops uh, in the department store Svitnoy in Megabella Dacia, and a few days ago we opened up a new store in uh, Lensky Prospect in Rio. Can you hear, can you hear me? Uh, First, can you get a translation of uh, what Paulina is saying? Yeah. Yeah? Oh, OK. Afterwards, give a one-minute summary of what you said, okay. or two minutes. To, so we all... Can you hear me? I have the chance. It's OK. Can you hear me? I'm great. Uh, great. OK, we are young. We are 2.5 years old. We fashion e-commerce. And uh, we also have a support in uh, in the form of offline shops, three in Moscow. So to promote our site, so we use mostly not advertisements, uh, but the content of high class, so which attracts users. We have a small media blog where we tell uh, our customers about our trends, about interesting events, what's going on about the competitions and festivals. And that's why uh, we formed or shaped a very good community. So um, we uh, also implement some collaboration events uh, with the first channel, for example, for instance, a T-shirt collection devoted to one of uh, the movies that was shown on the first TV channel. And we also use, use the extra PR and an epitaph form and Nadezhda Kolakolnikova. After she was released from jail, uh, she participated in our 
are sh shooting of our uh, some promotion video uh, well we uh, know we had to you know to sustain a kind of a trade off between her fans and antagonists so when we, we had a very good traffic uh, we uh, just traced it at our website and uh, all of this video was uh, you know published at all internet resources with a ref uh, with a link to our site so we very often participate on different events we was enough. We were co-participants at a picnic, uh, a fish, uh, or uh, so we attracted to the audience who uh, uh, buys our uh, clothes, so which we sell and we presented trends, not brands. So what uh, was presented at podium each year in Paris, Milano, New York, um, is normally present are normally presented uh, and but at a decent price. So, social media, I think it would be interesting for you. We have a lot of subscribers, and we are very proud of that. We have more, more than 110,000 subscribers. So we have a lot of discussions, uh, and we have a lot of reposts. So due to content and language we use to talk to them, so we use understandable language, use slang, and so, uh, well, and we just behave like body, so you can, they can body at our site. So uh, we just um, announce uh, new products, new trends, and we also have an entertainment content such as citations. Just uh, for instance, uh, uh, I bought uh, um, just a very good tea, but I'm uh, uh, absolutely sick from its uh, odor and taste. So that's kind of uh, an approach a lot of young girls like uh, in conversations. So we work a lot with celebrities uh, in social networks. Uh, we also uh, just implement some competitions. Celebrities are very loyal to us and uh, very often uh, uh, just uh, visit our stores. And they like trust brands and they say, thank you. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you. You are entrepreneurs. We are most of us entrepreneurs. So probably when you walk out of this hall, or you will probably want to take away as much as you can useful instruments with which you can make your business successful. So how to get more sales, how to get more brand awareness for your company. So I think that we have a beautiful panel here, not just aesthetically, but <laughs> also with power of mind. So. Our job is to, to share with you and also afterwards really much interact with you on what you can use practically to push your business forward. We have a few examples here of businesses that started zero, had thousands of staff only one and a half year later. Uh, and we, we use the whole mix of marketing tools to achieve this. And it's very interesting that in our panel we have very different areas. So we can focus a lot on what we call performance marketing, where we really focus on what you pay to get a transaction, and more of the, I'd say, PR, social media area, of which I understood there's also a lot of interest in the room to hear about. So uh, to get this started, uh, let's continue with our uh, introductions here. I promised ladies first. So Liz, you already, yeah, you wanted to, you already said briefly about yourself, but can no, you take I, a little well, more? Well, I think it's, it's a little more interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I work Don't be so modest. Tell us about yourself. Come on. I work for a Come crowdfunding on. site, um, and we actually are, you know, supporting lots of other businesses that are out there using many of these tools. But I think what's particularly interesting from the business owner's perspective is the trends that they are seeing in terms of how people interact with brands and how they are able to not only have uh, information that they push out, but pull information back in and, and, and how they can use that to, to better you know, target what they're doing in terms of reaching a, a, a big group of customers. So I'd love to hear a little bit about the trends and, and how they're having those conversations. Okay, cool stuff. That, well, this, this will be a beautiful panel then. We have both the, 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 the female element about, uh, hunt, uh, about collecting and we have hunting with, uh, with the context advertising and everything combined. That's interesting because that's the only balanced way, I guess, to, to build a business. Rohit, can you share with us more about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I spend most of my time uh, doing a combination of writing about the future of business 
So my can everybody hear is... Rohit? Sorry. You, no. Can you no? speak? Yeah. Scream like me okay. into this uh, <laughs> thing. Uh, so I spend. Is that better? Yes. Speaking. Uh, screaming. Yeah. Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about the future of business and writing about trends. So I have a annual trend report that I produce every year, uh, and I'll talk about some of the big trends for business and entrepreneurs in this coming year, 2014. And I've also written several books about how to create more human businesses. I advise startups and entrepreneurs, and I also have my own uh, startup publishing company that I'm working on right now. Uh, my background is brand strategy. I spent uh, 15 years working for large agencies, first Leo Burnett in Australia, then Ogilvy in uh, the US. And so my background is uh, brand marketing, and I hope to share some of that as well. Cool. Uh, maybe I should try Russian. Um, uh, about myself. Uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm from Holland, I'm Dutch. Uh, I lived for six years in uh, Russia. And uh, my passion is digital marketing. I did it from uh, the year of 2000. I worked in Australia and the United States and Europe uh, and in Russia now. I basically uh, is not a marketing uh, director. What I did for Kobe Wickel, I moved as a own and got jeans. But uh, um, just a kind of an investor, an angel investor. I have 25 shares in different companies in Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Russia. Uh, so the address is sacrebalder.com. And I also help uh, to launch online uh, stores uh, to develop them and to achieve before. Uh, sales in the form of performance marketing and the form of cash cash can boom. So each um, uh, each letter is kind of digital marketing and if we we'll, if uh, if uh, we already uh, uh, have, if you have time, we'll discuss performance marketing, uh, and uh, so in, uh, we'll discuss a search of optimization and what the direction should an entrepreneur follow to optimize uh, to optimize uh, its brand to reach, to achieve a success. That's about me. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Here in uh, Russia, he's from Germany, and uh, he's the CEO of Lamoda.ru. Who knows Lamoda.ru? Okay, we have some marketing to do, Niels. We need to do some work. Okay, Niels, can you tell a little bit about your background? Yeah, uh, hi everybody. My name is uh, Niels Tonsen. Uh, as Bas introduced, uh, I'm from Germany. A uh, little bit closer to the microphone. I came to Russia three years ago and co-founded uh, Lamoda.ru, which is now one of the leading uh, online fashion retail companies here in Russia, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. Um, we now have more than 2,000 employees and operate an own courier network, um, which is delivering next day to around 30 cities uh, across Ru Russia and Kazakhstan, which is really the specific about the business here. In terms of marketing, I think um, we have been very performance marketing driven, uh, amongst others uh, worked with Bus. On that, uh, so today, after three years, we have more than two million clients, um, which I think makes us one of the fastest growing e-commerce companies here in Russia. And I'm um, very happy to talk uh, a little bit more about the performance part of marketing. Okay, Liz, would you like to to take the start with the brand sure. and social media element? No, no, I think it would be interesting, um, both from a global perspective and and a Russian perspective. In since you both have companies here sort of what are some of the key customer trends that you're seeing? And then I was thinking maybe since you, the two of you at the end have sort of the global perspective, if you could comment as to whether you think those are um, global trends or maybe more specific to this market. So maybe that's something we can each, each answer. Me? Oh. Okay. Uh, no, на самом деле, мы... 
хорошо, но actually we try to trace all modern global trends, but still we follow our own pathway. And uh, which, uh, when we talk about uh, social media, uh, a good example are social competitions, uh, uh, which we implement to attract audience, to attract public. So we try to avoid like and share stories um, where, where a person doesn't do anything and he is not invo emotionally involved. We try to uh, involve people in, uh, emotionally, like uh, uh, a competition with parents. Uh, when we asked uh, uh, our um, audience to share uh, pictures of their parents, of their family, uh, when they were young. You see, so for instance, this is my mom. That's what how she looked like in the 80s. So it was, you know, very really very amusing. And uh, we have become a, a community which is very close to each other. And we try to do very simple and uh, some simple competition in the area of social media where a person uh, just needs to uh, to send uh, to mail a picture taken from his everyday life. And uh, uh, we publish all the responses, comments, communicate, and uh, a person has a feeling that he communicates with a brand directly. And he just talks with a brand and uses the same language. Uh, there's a question, Pauline. Uh, when if, if uh, you implement a social media campaign, uh, how, uh, how do you discuss the performance? What are the performance indicated? How you measure it? Noise? Uh, or there are some KPIs to do it. Uh, so we have them, you know, image competitions and some competitions which build up the number of our subscribers. Nice to Sartanova, our director understands and so separate these two spheres, you know, to attract subscribers and KPI, which we use to measure it. Certainly, this is, our, you know, just an important factor in our work. So, uh, so and this is an objective is set and we understand what, uh, how we'll do it, and most often we attract some companies who also have a lot of uh, social networks involved, who are very close to us and spirit, and uh, we implement a joint competition with such websites. So we even are not afraid to uh, share with other commerce and with other stores, for instance, with a, uh, for, for uh, a men's clothes uh, store. We had a joint uh, offline event uh, on St. Valentine's Day, and it was us. Uh, they brought boys and we brought girls, and the registration page was on our site and in our uh, social network. So their audience from this uh, social network uh, uh, were attracted to our site and stayed with us, the girls, I mean, because we have very interesting content for girls. So that's what we did. Thank you. Roy. I would manage or, or approach a social media interaction campaign. And after that, yeah. Niels, could you tell me a bit about some LaModa example of uh, what you did? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, maybe I can start by saying what I wouldn't do, uh, which is uh, I wouldn't try and be everywhere at once. I think the first thing that a lot of times you see people do is uh, say we want to start on social media, so let's start with Twitter. Let's go on to YouTube. Let's go on to Facebook. Uh, let's go on to uh, or wherever you know. And uh, the problem is you can't manage everything at once. So before I sort of share what I would do, I want to give you a resource. Uh, so please write this down. Uh, there's a website called www.15trends.com. The number fifteen one five and then trends.com. And a lot of the trends that I'm going to start sharing today, they're all available there. There's a completely free report um, that you can all have access to, and it details uh, a lot of the research behind some of the things that I'll share today. Uh, but one of the trends that I think is, is affecting a lot of businesses when it comes to social media is the idea of providing utility instead of trying to promote or market. And so what that means is a lot of times you are answering a question for someone. And when you answer a question or help them solve their problem, they come to you 
and end up purchasing something or converting or talking about whatever product or service you have. So utility, I think, is one of the big things that I would focus on with social media. Can you go out, listen to what people are asking, and then provide an answer or a solution? And then they'll come to your company, they'll come to your business and look for that. Thanks. Niels, how would you uh, proceed with... Uh well, look, I think um, from our perspective, it's a lot about the product you're actually selling and not so much about what you're really doing in that channel. Because I think in the end, communication um, is pretty clear. You know, you, you need to have somebody who can engage with the audience, who understands the audience, who can think like the audience. But the question is, what is your audience? And in, in terms of our case, uh, we are pretty mass market in, in terms of what we sell. So we would start selling a pair of jeans for $30 and go up to $500. So sort of to really make people engaged is, you know, to, to be aspirational and to not alienate a, a certain uh, part of that customer group. And I think here, for example, for trans brands, it's, it's a lot easier because you're going sharply into the kind of 20s, you know, like an Asus does. And so it's, I think, easier to build up a followership there. But as soon as you have a business or a brand, where you go in broader, it becomes very difficult. And um, I mean, we, we try to go um, and, and address that via personalization. I think what you can do is um, split your social media channels. So you would probably go for female, male, you would go for young, older, and the, these kind of things. But I think in order to be successful and really create a hype, you need to be very sharp in your, in your segmentation and actually having a great product that people love. Because in the end, I mean, you can talk so much about it. You can you can post the best content if you don't have the product that's behind it um, you know there's no purpose of it and it would never work and that's for example why Aces works so well because they just have such a great product you know, because they sell the right brands they have the right styles I think that's what it's more about in the end than just whatever you post okay. uh, Niels you, you because the product is so important um, once you have a customer though I mean getting a new customer is always you know the real challenge and then keeping a customer is often you know you you want to do that because getting new customers is very expensive so in order to keep these customers and have an ongoing dialogue is that do you use email a lot for that you, you mentioned personalization are you pushing out very specific messages and do you use a third party for that or is this all done internally are you using a service service of some sort that you, you might recommend to others? Um, so, I mean, again, there are several ways. Um, the biggest one to reactivate clients, obviously, email. Uh, you have SMS as well. You have retargeting, those kind of things. Um, segmentations and, and tools, yeah, we do in-house. Uh, so I think online marketing by now, a CRM, is very technical. It's very much about automizations, tech, uh, recommendation engines, because manually you will never be efficient, obviously. Um, so yeah, we do that. And then uh, I think on-site is also a very important part, because once they're coming to your site, you need to show them relevant things, right? So you, you, you should track and understand what did that guy look at be before on my website, what did he buy before, and what am I going to show him the next time he visits, um, and to, to actually uh, give him the impression that when he's coming back, he's really finding what he's searching for, and, and I think that in the end makes a loyal client. Plus, then obviously, the customer experience, which is very important in Russia in terms of the entire delivery aspect, you know, keeping promises, being on time, delivering with a, with a great customer experience, and I think that makes people come back in the end. Okay, well, that, that's where actually things, uh, f for me personally, will get very exciting because the beauty, of course, of, of, of internet and internet shops is that everything is measurable. You can see anything that's happening on the site. So if we're talking about retention and, and dialogue with customer and relevance, then um, we are now in really amazing times. And I want to give one example of where technology and personalization kind of really come together and what we can expect in the near future. And that is already more or less existing. Now, uh, it, maybe some of you have heard of real-time bidding technology, RTB. Okay, it's actually the difference between buying reach, which would be, okay, I buy a billion banners on uh, mail.ru, uh, and I want them to be for uh, women. Okay, that's one thing. You can also say, okay, I want somebody that has been on three sites, 
those sites, uh, Sapato, uh, Ozone, and then La Moda or something, uh, you can say, I want to have somebody that fits this particular, I'd say, DNA, DNK. Uh, I want not not of course on a biochemical level, but uh, basically what you see is that you have bid management systems um, that can real time in 20 milliseconds uh, place a bid to see if they want if their advertiser wants to show you as a unique individual a particular unique banner, and in the string of uh, algorithmic elements that define relevance, uh, you can actually have 250 parameters within 20 milliseconds decide how much it's worth to an advertiser to show a particular banner to you. And those 250 elements could be anything. It could be the time of day. Maybe they know from statistical data that at 11 a.m. you are not in the mood to buy. So you are just going to browse a bit, you're drinking your coffee, you're not relevant because you will not buy. So why would we spend as an advertiser money on you at 11 a.m. when we know that your particular psychodemographic segment will buy at 11 p.m. in the evening. So that would be one thing. Another thing could very well be that people that use Opera browser, which is one third of the online population in Russia, is doing different things online than people that use a Google Chrome browser. Not very different, but it could be about a few percent higher conversion rate uh, to be buying. It could be uh, the fact of which sites a person has visited, and I can go on and on. All of this is happening while you are opening your page of the news. Uh, no, not lenta.ru anymore, but uh, another news site in, in Russia. Uh, while you are loading the page, there's a, a big fight going on. There's different advertisers that say, hey, wait a second, that girl has yesterday been on La Moda, and we really want her back on the site. Niels wants her back definitely because she was looking at these krasne basanoshki, these red shoes, and she hasn't bought them. She should buy them. Of course, the advertiser cannot know why you didn't buy it. Maybe your wages are coming in tomorrow, and that's why you didn't press the buy button. Maybe you want to discuss it with your girlfriends or, or boyfriends. Uh, basically, at that moment, there's different companies all saying, wait a second. We understand from Google or whoever is, is giving the anonymous information that that particular uh, person is very likely to buy shoes. So uh, Eldorado will stop placing a bid because they don't want to sell an, an, a TV to a person that has been on three shoe sites to, and has been really thinking about buying, maybe even added already a product to their uh, Karzina, to their shopping basket, but not pressing the buy button. So in these 20 milliseconds that the page loads, the banners are actually not yet defined which one it's going to be. So one person is maybe offering 50 cents, another one a dollar to show you a particular banner. Now if we zoom in on the banner itself, you have what is called dynamic retargeting, which is actually on a product level. So it will not just show a nice little banner saying, hi, La Moda is great, or uh, Transparency is great. It will say, look at those three little items, those three sh shoes. Now, maybe somebody in the room here already has seen those banners that have been chasing you, and you hate it, right? <laughs> or you like it. Is it relevant? I don't know. Basically, the thing is, uh, you can actually, that's a tip, if you don't like being followed with the banner that you've clicked on, uh, with a product on it, uh, you can press the little cross on the right top side of the banner and you can opt out so that banner will not longer be shown to you. So the real-time bidding technology is basically allowing you as an advertiser to really only filter out the people that will buy or that you think have a very high propensity to buy and that you actually only target those. That's called uh, retargeting or dynamic remarketing. And this is something that now in Russia, about 1.2 billion rubles allegedly is being spent on this a year, um, which is only peanuts compared to the overall online marketing spend. But the returns from it are absolutely not bad. I think you can expect as an online business that 5 or 10 percent, maybe Niels has other data if he wants to share, uh, on how much of your sales can come from that. At a 
fairly okay reason because it's really highly targeted. So that was my little monologue about how retention can actually be used from uh, big data and uh, advertising technology. But getting back more a bit to the brand dialogue, uh, well, uh, it's very interesting because I think what you're talking about, you know, is extremely data div driven and very much able to to sort of break an individual down, not into just what they like, but what they like at that moment. Um, and, you know, I think that, Rohit, you, you mentioned that you, you bring humanity back into, into some of the marketing and thinking. And so at some levels, Boss is talking about breaking it down, you know, into an individual particle. How important is it to still think about the, the broader sort of emotional messages that, that brands need to bring forward? Because I think at one end, you know, I, I want to know when I should be buying those awesome red shoes, but I also want to feel an emotional connection um, to, to the brands. And so how, how are you thinking about bringing those two things together? Well, I, I saw many of you sort of smiling when, you, when he was talking about those banners chasing you uh, because you've seen that before and, and sometimes it's not so nice. Um, and I think it works in the retail business because you know that somebody was looking at a product. But I think if you're not in the retail business, then there's this whole other world that n people are talking about quite a lot that they're using different words for, but the most popular terminology is content marketing. And the idea behind content marketing, what everybody's talking about there, is if we can provide information that's very valuable for people, we can not only get them to come back to our site and maybe engage with us, buy something from us, or do what we want them to do. Maybe if you're running like a political campaign or you want somebody to believe in something. Uh, but we can also skip a lot of the money that we've got to spend because these things can get very important. I mean, like you said, everybody's competing for the same eyeballs. And so what happens in this bidding is the price goes up and up and up for the most popular spots. And instead of that, I mean, I think one example that uh, that I've been watching, which is in a completely different space, is a company that sells uh, wireless services to large uh, hotels. And they have a very business-to-business -business, uh, sort of product, right? Only a hotel manager or a hotel brand would purchase their service, and they'd put the wireless into the hotels. And so in order to promote that, one of the things that they did is they created a blog post and an infographic with a simple question which is, why does hotel Wi-Fi always suck? And everybody could look at that and they could say, well, yeah, I've been to a hotel where the Wi-Fi is so bad. Why is it so bad? Why can't they create great Wi-Fi in a hotel? And their whole story talks about what that takes. And through the process, what you realize is what they're essentially telling you is a human story about how it doesn't take that much money to create great Wi-Fi, and by the way, if you're a hotel brand and you're trying to get travelers to stay there over and over, hotel Wi-Fi is really important to people, especially business travelers, but more and more everybody because uh, they ha always have these devices, these tablets. I see many of you using your devices as well, and we use those when we're traveling. So there's an example where a company is saying, you know what, we could put banners and advertising out there, but we think that if we just create some really smart content to answer that question, we're going to get found by the people who are looking for our type of product. And hotels aren't buying new Wi-Fi systems every day, right? This is a long period when they have to sell it, probably years that it takes them in order to get into these companies. So depending on the type of business you've got, a strategy like that may actually yield much more over time, even if someone doesn't come tomorrow, click something, and buy something. So Niels, in terms of content, because you're very product focused, my guess is you are, you're pushing product first, but in terms of people who then comment on the product themselves, how much is the customer's reaction? Are they contributing content back to the site? Is that something that's an important piece of bringing in additional customers? I know at Amazon, that's clearly a, a big win for them. How, how is that working here for, for your site? So what is important actually in that similar to Amazon is um, product reviews. So you have people you know, talking about how does that fit in terms of sizing, um, how does the color look like in reality, and we're actually using that data to, for example, correct size scales because we're importing shoes from all over the world 
And what happens is you have to translate the size scales, right, to, to the Russian size scale. And then, for example, there might be some errors and you always get returns. So you're taking that customer feedback and implement that. In terms of really buying decisions, I think, to be honest, it, it's, it's not the most important thing for, for our side right now. So in terms of user content, and again, I think that works better in, in sites like Aces or probably Trends Brands, where you have this community around a certain lifestyle. Uh, specifically, and that's the 20s lifestyle in that case. Um, I think that works. If you're more mass market, I, it t tends to become much more difficult. On the product review piece of it, because you're sending um, delivery folks out into the actual real world and people are trying things on, are they also bringing information back that's making, making it easier for you to actually give true information to the consumer? Yeah, that's actually a very, a very good point, and uh, that's a very valuable contact with the consumer we have there uh, in Russia. And I think that's unique to the business model of, of uh, e-commerce that we run here. That we have this, we have a try-on service. So basically, if you order from La Moda three pairs of shoes, uh, our courier comes next day, shows you the goods. You have 15 minutes to try it on, and then you can basically decide, oh, I love the pink shoes. I'm just going to pay for those, um, and I give back the rest, right? So in those 15 minutes, we actually collect um, some information about the customer in terms of sizing, in terms of what he likes. Um, but I think there lies much more potential uh, when we will combine that with an application, you know, where you can then really say, okay, you didn't like this one, but you can reorder on the spot a different pair of shoes, etc. So again, it's about technology in the end, because if you do that manually, it's very difficult. I'm having a lot of challenge with my microphone. I apologize. Um, so, Paulina, in terms of content, you know. I would imagine sharing, and people, I love this, sharing with their fans is a big part, but in terms of fit and product reviews and all of that, is that something you also think is a driver for your brand? Of course. Of course, this is a very important moment. Product is very important. I told you a lot how we move forward our product, how we create the community around our product. But of course, the main purpose is to sell because we are a fashion shop. And of course, we are trying to collect information by all means and to receive a feedback from our clients. And it includes email, SMS. We call our, we telephone our clients and they write to us their recommendations recommendations, how they want to receive information in the future. But in addition, we are trying to create a kind of a friendly story. For example, for the new year, we had a tiny Santa and we called our most loyal uh, customers who bought most of all. And we told them that, hello, we are invite you for a personal meeting with our buying director and he will come with you to the shop and you will select things and he, you will be given these things for free. And of course, when these customers arrived, we were surprised with their comments about the sizes because sizes are extremely important because we are bringing clothes from different parts of the world, from Europe, America, Asia, and all the sizes are different. There is no... There, is a, there should be a correspondence between these sizes, and we are trying to do it successfully. So we create small focus groups, and we receive information directly from a person. And we follow not only where he go went, what he saw, we follow it uh, online, but also we communicate offline, and it helps a lot. Did I answer your question? the rest of the translation. And um, again, are you doing all of this in-house? Are you utilizing any third-party services or firms that, uh, and this is for both of you, that, that other folks in the room might, might be interested in, in learning about? In fact, opposite from the big project, such as uh, like uh, La Moda, we're a niche project, and we have a very narrow, specific audience. We use the services of the different agencies, advertising agencies, and in fact, we understood that uh, we better know our audience, and for us, it's easier to analyze, uh, to an analyze this audience. In terms of trends that you're seeing in Russia that may be different or moving at a different pace 
from other parts of the world. Is there anything, you know, for the, for the folks in the room from the other locations who might be trying to enter this market? Are there one or two things you think are really critical about the Russian market that might be different from other places around the world? No, I think that the main difference of Russia from the other world in the e-commerce is the well, is that people are still afraid to book, to order through the internet that uh, on the picture it looks better than the real thing. And these 15 minutes when the courier will be waiting for you to take a final decision to, to try the things or to refuse the things or to take only one thing, uh, still people are scared. And then we started to, we started to push forward the omni channel and I think that for Russia this is extremely important and it brings efficiency and good result because often people come to the shop they have a look at this at one uh, item and then they go back and they order it online then we are trying to combine this concept for example when the person goes to the cashier and he asks the cashier to leave this uh, item for a certain time and the shopkeeper says that don't worry you can order it online and we will give you a discount we give a choice a choice for selection from, from the, the the internet area comparing the world to Russia uh, the two big differences are of course and that's very connected to what you're saying that uh, a very, very large chunk. I think about 80% of people in Russia, they pay afterwards when they purchase, um, whereas in the West, everybody just uses their credit cards and, and buys. Um, that's one thing. And um, of course, also Russia with nine time zones has a lot more logistical issues than in the West. If you're in a small country like Holland, then you can start an internet company tomorrow and just click in some delivery service and everybody gets their product but here to deliver something to Kamchatka or then getting it back that's a nightmare in a lot of ways um, so and the other element is that um, uh, e-commerce itself is uh, is only two percent of all retail sales in Russia whereas in the West we're already at 20 or 25 percent so of, of all sales that goes through an online shop instead of an offline shop so that's something where Russia will probably still grow a lot uh, in the future Well, I mean, we have a, a thesis why that is. And um, if you look back um, a couple of years ago, I mean, there has been no comparable shopping experience in Russia to what people have seen in the West when they use e-commerce, right? Because you, you might have ordered something in a shop, it got canceled, it, it just comes in a week, um, while even the warehouses in Moscow, you live in Moscow, and then it's even delayed. You know, the courier comes out of the subway with a dirty plastic bag with your product in. So I think the, the e-commerce penetration um, is today so low because this kind of customer experience that people globally drive towards e-commerce, and, and that's particularly what you see in the West, um, is only available in Russia for about two years, I think. You know, when people really started building up their own career service, getting better on the executional part. And if I look at it to now, uh, today, um, I have a better shopping experience sitting in Yekaterinburg than in Berlin, actually. Because uh, I get my goods next day, I get it for free, I have to try on at the door, etc. And I think this is right now really becoming a mass market thing um, with enough people in the market having experienced such a great customer experience that network effects uh, are starting to take place, brand awareness of e-commerce shops uh, rising uh, constantly. And I think uh, Russia will in the next years uh, catch up very quickly. So if you're thinking to do something in that space, I think right now is, is, is probably the best time to do that. Rohit, do you think uh, that the trends that they're talking about here in terms of Russia's pace of development, do you expect the pace of development to be faster than maybe we've seen in the West because they're, in addition to playing catch up, they've got these unique market situations? Yeah, I, I think it actually will be faster. And the, the reason why I think so is because uh, one, one of the trends that I spent a lot of time writing about was what I called obsessive productivity. This idea that now we have technology in so many parts of our life, in work, and in our personal lives that we expect to be productive. Uh, people don't sit and wait for a bus for 20 minutes and do nothing anymore. 
you do something. And it's the something is not taking a magazine, it's taking your phone, it's doing some work. You expect your email to filter out uh, the, the emails that you don't want anymore. Uh, there was one um, fascinating and slightly uh, sad and tragic example that I used in the presentation of the trends, which is uh, these moms from New York who were uh, hiring handicapped, disabled tour guides to take their kids to Disney World because they could skip the lines and uh, get onto the rides faster because there's a separate line if you're disabled. And it was one of those examples of people who just, even in a situation like that where they go to a place where usually you have to wait in a queue to get onto a ride, now they weren't even willing to do that. And I think the way that relates to our businesses is as more and more people become accustomed to finding ways of being more productive in every moment, e-commerce is going to start getting bigger and bigger as a piece of that because it's obviously way more convenient to order something online instead of having to go into a store, particularly when it's things that are exactly the same. So clothing is, uh, is a little bit more challenging because you need to try things on, it's, it's different, it fits differently. But why would anybody go to a store and purchase a digital camera after they've done all of their research online, they know what they're trying to find, they're just looking for the best price. Nobody's going to physically go into a store anymore. There's no value to doing that anymore. Everything's going to become more efficient. People will do that online. And as soon as that aspect of retail starts growing vastly online, I think you'll see that explosion happen. So, Boss, getting back to some of the digital tools, um, as people become uh, perhaps uh, less involved with the salesperson, especially for products that are maybe more, more um, less unique like clothes and things of that nature. Do you expect the tools to do more to sort of um, suggest things that they maybe haven't even looked at yet, but because of the whole collection of products that they're looking at and getting even more into the psychology of the shopping. Do you think we'll see an increase in those kinds of things? It's one thing to say, hey, you, you looked at these shoes, you might like those shoes, but it could say, you've looked at these 500 items and that tells me you live in the suburbs and you have a child and maybe you should look at this kind of a car or something kind of bringing it to the next level. Do, do you see that trend happening? Uh, definitely, and I have a, a, a challenging statement about that because I, I was always, from the theory, extremely excited about the relevance and about I thought, this is dynamite, this will triple your business. Now, I've done a lot of testing. There's a lot of digital tools with which you can do A-B testing on the site. Um, and s let me take it one step back. When you look at digital marketing, I have discovered that there's a new kind of triangle. We already covered one element, which was the personalized banners that you either love or hate, but they are relevant. But the thing is, why is it about the, the form? We are actually distributing a message. Now, I'm not just talking about a brand communication message, because it could even be the product on the banner. I'm talking about the fact that banner is just a medium. It's a type of bullet in a machine gun. You can also say, on the website itself, you have the internal recommendations. People that looked for this notebook, they actually bought another notebook. Uh, so it actually shows you a recommendation. Now that's actually in some way almost exactly the same because a person's behavior on the site uh, has shown its particular in his or her particular interest and um, the recommendations, they um, bring it to the next point. It's almost like the person in the shop that says, oh, you like this dress? Well, you know, we also have this other dress that might look well on you as well. Oh, yeah, that, that's actually better. I'll take that one. So that's the second part of the triangle. And then the third one is you can also use this behavioral data in emails. So you get this Bermuda Triangle out of which the consumer can hardly escape uh, because it's being completely relevantly engaged or uh, predicted. Now maybe Rohit has a different view on whether that's human or maybe it's too pushy, but at the end of the day, um, the, uh, the triangle of you first coming to a site, clicking on that particular a little a pair of red shoes, then all of a sudden getting a recommendation that people that have also clicked on that shoe actually bought those blue shoes that were uh, quite interesting. You leave the site you don't buy, you get an email 
that says, wait a second, this week we have free delivery. If you buy it and in there integrated is already the little red shoe that you clicked on in the site. This is, of course, if you left your email address. And uh, afterwards, you're still not buying for some reason. There's an email, uh, there's banners showing you it. After a week, you are completely brainwashed and hypnotized by these red shoes and you think, okay, I'm just going to buy them. So the data relevancy with the tools is, is really great. But as I was saying at the very beginning, it sounds cool. But firstly, doing this in practice and getting your IT department to drill, uh, this, the, to set up the, straight, the, the right data warehouse, uh, the right approaches, using the right suppliers, that's already a painstaking process. And apart from that, when you already finally have it technically in order, there is still um, the issue that you, um, you, you may want to uh, use different elements. Why? Because we tested this and we saw an, an, an increase of about 4% uh, in, 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 in sales because of it. Now, there's been, of course, very different verticals, etc. Uh, I've also seen that recommendations delivered 50% higher conversion. So you cannot take the 4% number as a good element, but that was for allowing uh, this whole mix of internal recommendations with product reviews showing only 4% better conversions. Then I think, wait a second, that's of course on a big, big business, that's a lot of money. And yes, you will be uh, profitable or ROI positive when you invest in those tools, y you will get more from it. But I was hoping you'll get 40% more because when I go to the site and I click on the red shoes and then somebody else shows me uh, the pair of shoes that a hundred people that clicked on the red shoe actually bought instead, like uh, blue shoes, whatever, uh, I'd expected more of it. So it could be that the data management itself was not optimal yet, uh, but maybe it's just that the normal, the, the, the new long tail approach of digital marketing where you need so many different tools will actually give you 4% improvement there, 5% there. Maybe the times are over of saying, oh, I tripled my conversion because I actually showed images on my site or something. So those days are over. Uh, I think now we need to just have this whole encyclopedic range of instruments that jointly help. And the funny thing there is, and then I'll shut up, is that um, all these little tools, it's all so nice and technical and also smart and it's all the brain, the brain, the brain. I completely agree that when you go to the heart and you have one of those amazing things, I loved what you were saying about the Secret Santa uh, campaign. That's where McKinsey says that two thirds of all transactions is word of mouth. Now create a genius viral campaign and you don't have to spend a cent afterwards because it just lives its own life. There's nothing now better than either having an amazing product that people tell each other about or amazing communication and that's the cheaper way of marketing. But the, the horrible thing there is that it's never predictable. You can have a small group of absolute fanatics that show a conversion that's 10 times higher but you can't clone these people and once you've got the whole group of fans satisfied afterwards trying to convince other people on the street with this same strategy is much harder. So that's why it's probably a beautiful mix of hunting and collecting. And um, well, you know, it's interesting because I think I don't, I, maybe the, the women in the room might relate to this more, but sometimes the shopping is not about the buying. It's <laughs> about the shopping, right? And so Very weak email, if, yes. if, if you're out with your friends and you're just, you know, I, I probably can't afford the Manolos, but I can try them on and I can see what they're like. And then maybe I can find the, the lookalike pair for less or something. I think that emotional piece of shopping is, is something that perhaps is lost in some of the digital marketing and and maybe um, you know Rohit maybe maybe there's something you want to comment on there or yeah, you know I, yeah. as, as retail folks you want us to shop every time but what about that emotional piece well I think the the place where I see it coming back there's probably two places one is um, with the the real person behind it so now with social media for example uh, what Bass was saying with personal recommendation there's nothing more human than having a friend that you actually know say, yeah, I love this, you should check it out. That's one thing. I think the other thing is adding discovery into these experiences. So instead of just re recommending the next product or personalizing, giving people a chance to explore, to discover, which is actually something you see very commonly in the travel industry. That the travel industry understands that in order for you to go and book your next vacation to Mexico, they first have to get you to start dreaming of that vacation in Mexico. 
And so a lot of the content that you'll see on that experience is designed to help you picture yourself there. The images, the experiences, the people that you'll meet, the places you can go, all of it is designed to create that emotional connection so that when you do get to that point and you say, okay, now I'm ready to go, it's already in your head that, you, that you're just waiting for that, especially when the weather's like this and you're thinking of beautiful sun and beaches, it gets in your head and that really helps to sell that experience. I would like to add to that. Um, I was the CMO of uh, eBookers, which is Orbitz, and um, in Chicago, where the head office was, we had a beautiful example of this where technology meets the heart. Um, it was really crazy to see what happens when you have your travel website uh, with, the, with the booking engine on it. Uh, and at some point, you need more sales, and you say, you know what, bring out again the people on the beach. And what did that mean with our team? That there was one particular type of photo of a man and a woman on a beach. And if you would upload this photo next to the booking engine, the second or the minute after it was uploaded, you could see sales rise. And that, that's so beautiful of the fact that you can measure everything and even real time. We saw, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> basically. Um, it was uh, it was just amazing to see that it immediately had visual impact. Also, landing pages. On landing pages, we tested in Russia hundreds of photos. When we, you know, Copy Veep, the shopping club, right? We did um, a test where we had three different types of photos uh, connected to the page where people would come to register. One was this fancy Moscow girl that has all these expensive shopping bags on her arms, uh, walking. The second one was kind of a, a scruffy, strange guy, a bit like me, unshaven, with his girlfriend. Uh, and the third photo was uh, just beautiful photos of shoes. Now, we thought, okay, this glamorous girl, the coupe vip, trendy, blah, 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 that's going to make it. No, fail. But then we thought, the beautiful shoes, that will help. Uh, no, it was just the guy with the girl that were somehow appealing to the target audience, maybe especially in the regions. Maybe they didn't like this glamorous Moscow girl, I don't know. But we had a 34% higher visitor to registration, uh, this is a few years ago, uh, from that particular set of photos um, than elsewhere. Also, celebrity recommendations can give you up sometimes up to 25% higher conversion if you just have a trustworthy face on the photo. So speaking of measurable emotional approaches. Um, I think we are in for a beautiful future because we, maybe men, should be stopping too much with all the Excel data spreadsheets, but at least we can help the women with the beautiful communication and supply the data on where it works. Because the rule number one, I'd say, in marketing is don't believe that how you think your customers work is the way they are thinking. So listening to them, focus groups, and measuring on sites, websites, that together can really give you the best customer insight. I think that's with sort of the growth of Pinterest, right? Is trying to, to bring in this, um, you know, Retailers want to take that and convert it to sales, but bringing in that emotion. Um, there's an ad that runs on TV in the US that Corona runs for the Corona beer, and they just show people sitting on a beach and transforming their office into sort of a beach environment by having this beer. And I'd, I'd love to hear from you guys how you try to create context of that sort so that people think, oh, this, this is going to get me to that next level. And again, it, it, maybe it's a little more on trends, but in terms of um, a, a broad shopping experience where I know I can find lots of different types of items and lots of different price ranges, how is it that I am sort of emotionally brought in to, to your site or to your site? I'll start. Well, uh, I'm so happy to listen to what my uh, the other panelists saying because that's what we do. We bring our emotional component to all we do. Can you hear me? This is how you bring emotion. That um, music and balalaika, matryoshka, yes. 
Так вот, на самом деле мы стараемся действительно создать experience. Okay, we try to, to to shape a certain experience, and uh, for instance, a girl comes to our site. We try to we give a support to her when she doesn't want to buy anything, but just to enjoy some beautiful things. For instance, using our blog and and uh, our branding, so we don't have pictures where you won't see their pictures with aggressive um, um, advertisement. Uh, with an uh, aggressive message uh, that would say, buy it, buy it, buy it. No, it's more related to our, uh, with a quick response to the weather, to, you know, to the you know, current events in Moscow, for instance. Well, it's sunny weather, um, go outside, don't buy clothes, just have a walk. Uh, and uh, the girl would be pleased, and she said, oh, and if I go outside, what would you put on? So, and uh, she will try to find maybe some a new dress. So it's a message, an emotional message, an emotional communication with our audience uh, is the base of our new concept uh, in a club of, inter of common interests. So a lot of girls need, a, uh, need to have a platform uh, to communicate, to discuss uh, what they bought, uh, and uh, uh, just and apart from that, they will discuss some psychological moments of, for instance, uh, buying sports, politics. It's uh, certainly would be tied up to, the, to their buys, and they also have uh, a chance to look at the banner, to, to know some, uh, to know about some new goods on our site, and but still, this will retain people, and uh, they will stay at our site for a long time. They will be more loyal. This information. Maybe we should slowly have a small interaction of asking, for instance, uh, uh, let, let's see what tools for promotion like. Uh, does anybody here feel that their business has very good content marketing? Can I see some hands? I'm not going to ask you to tell a lot about it, but just seeing the level of marketing approach here. Does, do people here have a lot of content they publish for their business? Okay. Okay. Do people here use Yandex uh, to advertise? Okay. Do people use offline ads in magazines? To ad advertise. Or public relations or something of that nature. Okay. One. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So what do you do? Now, do you use emails? Do you send emails to clients to get them? You don't even use emails. Are you selling anything? Oh, it's not. Oh, or maybe I'm not audible. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Two people can hear me. Okay. Look. Uh, basically, what I want to get to is that we try to give you as much useful tools for your particular business needs. You are entrepreneurs or in working in a company, right? So, uh, no, you're not. Uh, tell me. Look. Okay, no entrepreneurs. Okay, this is the global entrepreneurship <laughs> hunger. Okay, so. Well, maybe we should open it to some questions that. That, yeah. that you folks might have. We have a gentleman with a microphone. All right, we have someone with a question. Fantastic. So, hello. My name is Willie Conrad Asego. I'm coming from Gabon, a small African country. I own a transport company. So, uh, I had a question regarding what you just said about uh, talking to customers, email, mailing, advertising, and so on. What would you suggest uh, to uh, small to SMEs uh, to SMEs to work when there is a lot of majors around? Like major what? Sorry, majors companies. Okay, if I understand your question well, and I hope everybody heard it, you you, you have a, 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 a transport company exactly. in Gabon, right? Yes. And you are looking on a, in a way to push what what kind of methods to use as a smaller business exactly. versus uh, a larger company. Well, again, but maybe I'm a bit obsessed, but I'd say the internet is your friend because. Um, you would probably be looking for B2B customers, right? You, there I'd say that uh, I'm of course not sure about the, the penetration uh, of internet business people uh, or business people on LinkedIn, but you could at least test having context relevant ads that everybody that's in the transport section can show, can see a little ad on LinkedIn when they're 
browsing their messages or the news on it uh, with your particular offering. Maybe you have a certain very lo local specific know-how that you're willing to share and you create a, a small paper with the 10 points for good transport services in Gabon and you actually say that that's for free to download on your website and you enter into an engagement with this customer. Same thing is you can use uh, Google for every search that's relevant for transportation uh, which could actually be generated by Google uh, as, a, as a semantic yadro, uh, semantička uh, yadro, like a semantic funnel, a no, kernel, what do you call it, like the list of keywords uh, that you basically uh, use for people that search and oh, everybody that's searching for it sh sh gets your company shown and you only pay for the people that actively click on it so your risks are fairly low you can set a very small daily budget uh, if you don't know uh, how to do this they have their own free online courses you can go on YouTube to watch it's not that hard plus there's even promo codes with fifty dollars for free to try uh, Yandex in Russia of course uh, does this as well so I'd say that those two are ways in which you can fairly risk-free on a low level compete with the big guys and just make sure that before you do this you take a little calculator and you say how much is one uh, paying customer worth to me. If you say, okay, in one year time, I will do $6,000 of business with that person, whether it's on a gross level or on a profit margin level, uh, you can say, okay, then I'd risk to pay 10% of that amount to acquire this customer. So, okay, you have a budget of $600, then you should carefully test because you can maybe expect that only 1% of all the people that click will actually interact with you or maybe uh, only half a percent will actually buy from you or become your customer so I would also um, just uh, t to add to that I would also think about I mean if you're in a business, speak a little bit closer yeah yeah if you're in a business that's not predominantly online use the assets that you have so if you have vehicles and uh, things like that because you're in a transport business what do they say on them right do you have the brand that you're building along with your company do people see that and if you could, I mean, if you ask yourself, for 2014, if I have 10 customers, my primary marketing goal will be for each one of those 10 people to get me recommended to one other person. You double your business with no advertising at all. Um, so I think use what you have already and build from there. That's what all successful entrepreneurs do. Referral marketing, I think, is one thing I was thinking as well as, you know, if if you're a smaller business and you could get recommended, it's almost worth giving away that whole customer acquisition cost for that referral to get that next customer in the door. I was gonna ask you guys, do you use referral marketing, like send this to a friend, get X percent off? Is this something that's, that has helped you build your businesses at all? Yeah, we do that. We do that, but it's, uh, it's a very small percentage of the overall acquisition business, so I think, um, what, what, what is very helpful is to monitor your reputation online. So whenever you have something like Yandex Market, etc., you sh should spend a lot of attention on making sure that um, you are top ranking there, you are addressing all the concerns and all the problems that your customers have because that is a real big multiplicator in the end. Can I ask, the, the transportation business, is it about trucks delivering cargo or is it transportation of people? As a business people concierge. Is a business people concierge, car rental company from the, uh, let's say you would like to go to Gabon, you emailing me, I provide you a car with driver, with all the intendants you need. So, so the, you, you provide the car for them? So exactly. It's, okay. Uh -huh. Okay, what I can then also recommend is maybe strategic partnerships with companies that get in touch with a lot of those people. At a conference, you can have a... F no. <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the conference, you can have your flyer inside the bag, which is really relevant. You can... Uh, uh, think of ways for them uh, to be uh, uh, connected to the Chamber of Commerce for uh, a free seminar where those entrepreneurs that could be clients are listening to your advice, things like that. Um, be, uh. Uh, Niels, offline marketing, do you find that's completely useless for you guys? It's all about online or is there a value to spending anything in the offline world? 
Uh, good question. So offline, the problem is it's not very measurable. So how do you want to judge in the end? So what we do is we do, for example, TV advertisement, but we measure very closely what is going to be the traffic and sales impact after each spot. Um, so it, everything we do, even if it's offline or a different medium than internet, it's it's pretty analytical. Um, but if you have anything great where you get sponsorings, co-marketing deals for free, I mean that's that's obviously something you should pursue as long as your costs are not too high. Um, as soon as your costs are becoming significant, you should be able to have a rationale in terms of numbers behind it, I think. So you're not, you're not really using it for awareness, you're still using your offline specifically to drive sales? So the awareness is a side product. Uh, so we're not doing any campaigns except for co-branding. So for example, we had a campaign with uh, Nestle where we co-branded the boxes of the, the morning cereals, this fitness cereals. So that was like three million uh, packages in, in Russia and it didn't cost us a cent. So this is kind of the stuff you know you, you can do. But um, the rest is performance driven and uh, all the brand awareness you get as a side product because it's not something you know we can quantify in terms of ROI in the end. So is there anyone from the audience who's in the uh, offline world or, or, you know, trying to convince these guys it's, it's still worth it? Hello? What? This one is working. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Um, I don't work in the offline marketing, but uh, I just want to comment on uh, La Moda that I've been here in Russia just uh, over half a year, and uh, I follow La Moda mostly on, on the news side, like what are they doing, who are they, and they're doing great. But uh, I must say that, that the cars that that transport the products to the clients are, are also offline marketing and, uh, and it's one of the most uh, most visual thing I've seen uh, that you have and they're for the most part they've been clean even though the streets have might have been dirty but you know the kind of uh, image you portray uh, through those moving advertised that are in the traffic and people sit a lot in the traffic you can really uh, stick out from the from the long queues and uh, I don't know how many people will see your uh, car on a daily basis, but uh, and that's like a free advertising uh, way. So that's kind of created one sort of image for me, and uh, I think it should be, a, even though a traditional channel uh, could be valuable to explore even more. It's, it's quite interesting because in the U.S., most of this is done through UPS and FedEx, so all the advertising is really sort of going to them except for the boxes. But you've made the decision to do this more of an in-house thing. Any, any comments on that? For and so first of all, it was a necessity in, in Russia. So if you want to do e-commerce on a big scale, you, you need to run the operations yourself. Uh, if you don't want to go bankrupt and you want to have a great customer experience. So okay. that was one. Um, Two was obviously if you have the opportunity and you're investing in that, you should brand it as well because the branding is not expensive and gives sort of a, the trust element you were you were referring to. I think that by now is not a big problem anymore in the market, but it helps certainly. It's still the question uh, again, like if you're starting and uh, I mean building a business is, is like mostly starting from zero. Can you start a business based on branding? No, because this kind of network effect of a lot of people seeing the cars only works when you have 150 cars in a city or, or more and um, in the end you get there by performance marketing but then you need to build the branding on top and on the side so I think you can do you can do not only a performance marketing be successful and disregard the brand on the other hand if you only build a business via the brand it needs to be very specific business in a, in a certain uh, very sharp customer group having the best product in the market and the best communication that, that's what I think and we're trying to do both at the same time Other questions from the, uh, oh, oh. Спасибо. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for a very interesting discussion. But I have a question. I would say it's a general question. First of all, 
uh, what is the reason of uh, uh, what what is the main content of the fast brand what is the main meaning of the fast brand what is the difference of the fast brand uh, from the usual brand and the second question what is the correspondence what is the relevance is more interesting uh, more in, uh, more more vital uh, the brand versus trademark Uh, because they are relevant in somehow, but what is your opinion about it? Thank you. So the question is, what does fast brands mean to you, and 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 how is it different from sort of traditional brands? No, как минимум мы занимаемся. Well, as a minimum, we are dealing with fast fashion, and all our supplies they come in small quantities and they change very fast. We have a great number of brands. They are known brands. And there is no reason for us to move forward this brand, to advertise this brand. There is no reason for us to advertise our brand, or which already exists. And with the fast supplies, we are interested to strengthen our brand. For myself and for my company, Fast Brand, uh, well, we became well known within two years at the expense of Bright, exactly to the point events and fast positioning. I would say that fast brands, they work for with the young audience and they are our main tra- target audience. We are seeing at least um, in the fashion market, and I think that might be similar globally to any industry that's affected by internet, is uh, is a diversification or detailization of, of people's interests. So people go in a lot more for niche brands that are like, for example, you see Instagram shops of handmade stuff right now popping up everywhere. You see people selling through WhatsApp. You see uh, smaller niche brands being successful, and that's for me a fast, small brand. And, and, and that is something that is being enabled by the internet. So in the end, you need to decide what you want to stand for with your brand. Um, at the same time, feature, feature a constant arrangement of, of smaller brands to keep the interest from the consumer side. So I think um, today to build an iconic brand, um, which takes probably 20 to 30 years, very difficult and, and mostly for the business that start right now. Um, they're rather looking for the short term horizon, like you say. and, and That's for me, you know, you know, a fast brand. You need to stand for like very specific things. So for us, it's more like we are a platform. We are about delivery experience, and we feature a lot of other smaller brands to 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 have the selection for the consumer. Rohit, do you think the consumer will be exhausted from the pace of change, or do you think that this is just the way of the world now, that things are fast and changing, and that platforms that can continually feed this frenzy will ultimately win? You know, I I think for for many years, uh, consumers have been faster than the brands that they buy from. And now I think brands are just starting to catch up. So I, I don't think that people get fatigued as much as brands get fatigued. I mean, if you think about brand marketing, traditionally it's all campaign based. And what the company says is, we're going to talk about this for six months, and then we're going to change CMOs, and then we're going to talk about something else just when people start to get it. And I think that as marketers, we tend to get tired of something just when people are starting to understand what it means and starting to associate our brand with it. So you think about really iconic brands to, to what you were talking about, they don't change completely every six months, even if they have a new CMO. And I think that the young brands, the brands that are less than 10 years old or less than five years old or less than six months old, like there's something you can learn from from that. I think we had a woman before me. Good afternoon. I am Mariana from St. Petersburg, Russia, and I'm an entrepreneur, co-owner of online platform, uh, which provides opportunity to book and buy tickets online on buses. And uh, in your conversation, you mentioned that Russian people are not willing to pay online for shoes and clothes. Do you have any statistics about uh, their buying behavior of tickets 
and uh, if it's low comparing to the other countries, is there any channels, uh, methods to promote this way of payment? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been seven years in online travel, but and I have, I'm, sh uh, I think. If I understood, because I couldn't really hear the question that well, but um, you wanted some data. I'd say that for, uh, if we talk travel, are we talking online flight tickets? Are we talking tour packages? Are we talking hotel bookings or a mix? We're talking about bus tickets. Bus tickets, oh, bus tickets. Uh, okay. buying online through online platform. Oh my goodness. So what's the average cost of, say, an, a bus ticket? The same as in the market. If they buy in cashier, uh, in cashier office, it's the uh, same. Yeah, but what is it, like 40 rubles or or, uh, or do you sell like a, a strip of 10 tickets so it's 400 rubles? Or I want to understand, because if it's a, a dollar for a ticket, it, maybe it doesn't even make much sense. A person will probably not go to your website to register and purchase a ticket and stuff. If it's an extremely easy app on your mobile and you just press it once or you hold it next to the the bus uh, scanner, that's maybe a good marketing tool, but I'm trying to understand, you want statistics on conversion? Uh, uh, generally about uh, buying t uh, tickets online mm, of Russian uh, customers. And uh, if okay. they are not interested uh, or they don't show interest uh, to buy tickets online, maybe you can recommend uh, some way how to promote uh, online buying. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, with the fact here that you are in a tough situation because your unit price is extremely low. So Google will not be interested in you or you will not be interested in Google to be paying for ads because you have a conversion rate of 5%, for instance, so you need 20 people to come, which then costs you 2 $3 to get one sale. And the ticket itself is maybe costing a dollar. So, uh, unfortunately, paid channel acquisition sounds only interesting if you can say, okay, click here and get a year subscription with 10% discount, or buy now, or or set up an automatic debit from your 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 card or something. So, I think here what would be most useful is indeed as a business tool to have an app that makes it extremely useful, much more useful, by f for instance, to skip the queues of waiting to buy the tickets or um, have all the times of the buses updated in your phone all the time or you can actually see almost like uh, a taxi app where the bus is going, something like that that you then connect to I need to, to specif specify yeah. my question. It's about uh, intercity buses or international uh, roads. So it's ah, not like a bus which like, we look, see so on the So that's already not Sorry. one dollar. Oh, and that's the cool. Price around, oh, we're getting uh, into normal say, travel. Euro. Okay, cool. Yeah. So um, bus tickets is a great product. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so here <laughs> we can go back and say yes. Context advertising is good. Google loves you. Um, <laughs> So uh, I'd say for you, of course, make sure that you have great travel content that's uniquely created about the destination, just as any travel website. Uh, make sure it's search engine friendly. Uh, try to spend not much more than 165 rubles for creation of a relevant content page, unless you see that it's really uh, your top destination. The good thing is here, I'm not, I'm not understanding that you probably have 10 destinations or 50. Um, so. Um, I'd say that you make sure that you have good destination pages that are picked up in the search engines, that's free traffic. Uh, you make sure that you actually deal with large travel content sites to maybe integrate some sort of booking engine on their site on a revenue share basis if they are agreeing to it. If you are a small startup, maybe not everybody wants to do it, but if you are a, a hotel booking site, maybe then it's great to have an extra service to your customers to also book a, a, a bus ticket. Uh, maybe even get some additional income from people that would love to sell stuff to the people that uh, buy your air, uh, bus tickets. For instance, maybe there's a fresh, uh, like a lemonade that wants to give a free sample to everybody in the bus. Or what you see with S7 airlines who have all kinds of little new chocolates in there, I'm sure they're getting paid to, um, is there anybody from S7 airlines in this room? <laughs> I'm sure they're getting paid to put this uh, particular product in there. So you can make yourself more attractive, like, oh, buy this ticket, like what Niels was saying about Nestle and La Moda. Uh, 
that is an extra attraction. If it's really about pushing uh, the, the product uh, forward, I'd say that you need to make sure to uh, just be interconnected with an affiliate program. So if booking.com is integrating you, as I already that will all of a sudden bring you 10, 20 percent more business or 50 percent more, uh, and you just get it on a no cure, no pay basis. It may take you six months before they agree, uh, although they have a standard uh, affiliate program on their site. Um, but th then at one point when you're live as a business development thing, um, it's not even marketing anymore. It's just getting free sales and just paying your partner commissions on it. I think. For the rest of the room, it's maybe better to have a, a five-minute brainstorm afterwards where I can give you some advice. But, uh, but that's probably the first things where I'd say focus on. Good luck. Thank you. Yes, hello. <coughs> My name is Elias Mosholm. I'm from Notified Russia. We do social media monitoring. And I heard, Niels, you said it was important to monitor what your customers actually say and do. And we've been into the data of what they do on the site. Uh, what my experience is that people who do monitoring of what people of what the customers actually say about them and about the competitors in social media is the first step is just they're really happy to just hear w what's the buzz about us <clears throat> but what I see is the most important part is when they start using it for sales or or like supporting the customers and I would like to hear if you have any experience of that, how you've been using it, if if you feel it's important at all, or if it's not giving anything, to get into that, like to see what people are saying outside your channels to actually communicate with them. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, where are we? But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can I can start just with one example of a, a customer that I have who is using monitoring for two things specifically. One is crisis monitoring. So trying to identify if there will be a crisis for their products. Um, and the second is to see what the... Excuse me, how do they do that? So they're looking for mentions of something that's gone wrong with a product, for example, or someone who is particularly high influence, who's talking about something negative relating to one of their products. So they can see if someone, for example, shares something on Twitter and it gets retweeted 50 times within the first five minutes. Uh, they know that something has acceleration. So they're watching for acceleration of something negative uh, so that they can see it early. Because what's happening in uh, global media right now is media and uh, journalists are watching social media for stories. And when something starts to take off in social media, it may become a media story, at which point then it becomes a full crisis for a brand. So that's one way that they're, that they're using that. The other is to identify opportunities for new products, um, fixing a particular product issue or changing the way that they're promoting a certain product, uh, regional spikes, so people talking about a product in one part of the world or one part of the country, uh, and identifying that so that they can send more product to that area. Uh, so it's really business management in multiple ways. There's so many ways of using it, but those are, those are two ways in particular. Niels, I'm guessing you guys monitor your boards and, and use this as customer um, for, for customer support. I know that at, at our company we um, empower every single person there. If you see something, get on Twitter, respond, go on Facebook, respond. We, we don't put a lot of rules around it. We try to make everybody have a, a real genuine voice and we find we can really turn people around who have had complaints or problems. Certainly you can get new ideas as well, but I think it's becoming um, sort of a de facto customer support tool, but I'd love to hear you guys talk about it. No, th that's pretty much like you said. So we have a department within customer service that is uh, focusing on boards and socials. So it's, it's really, I think the, it's about listening and about solving the problem as quickly as possible. Um, and not really about then, you know, trying to push people to make an additional sale because I think that's, that's just going to be backfiring in the end. So I think it's really about problem solving, as you said. Do you find people sharing once someone reaches out and then you get the positive tweet afterwards? I, I assume you see that kind of thing. 
Да, на самом деле у нас... Yes, so we also have a huge experience in response to comments of our users and uh, of people who are, uh, also place their orders in social networks. They are very active, and even they post some negative comments. We never, never delete them because uh, it's our uh, role we stick to, and we try very politely respond to it and uh, try to smooth out the situation and to send uh, uh, well, some you know, pleasant news to this customer and try to retain uh, this uh, buyer, try to uh, still retain him loyal to our side. It could be a negative comment and when, and another comment follows, uh, which is absolutely positive to one of the same goods. It's very interesting to, uh, to track it down and it is very, uh, very, very useful for, our, for us. Um, yeah, I was going to say, we we'll maybe yeah. take one more question and wrap up. Здравствуйте, меня... Hello, my name is Jan Dors. I'm from Kazakhstan. Uh, my question uh, about promotion, uh, online promotion. Uh, I am just a common user of online services and talking about Lam order. So there was um, a point when it was... Uh, too much um, advertising from La Moda on online, so I, I found it absolutely everywhere, everywhere in my email and Yandex and Google and Facebook and just uh, you know a lot of bonus around. So I tried to get rid uh, of this um, of this advertisement. I tried to scam how to put it in a spam files to switch it off and so on. So this is a question to other experts, not to La Moda. Is is it a success or it is, um, uh, well, maybe closer, closer to a failure because you, are too, uh, you pay too much for your advertisement in a country where you don't have competitors? So we have uh, Niels. No, no. Um, this is very good point. Like, where are you being a bulldozer marketeer and where are you using a microscope, etc.? Now, uh, again, uh, the thing is, if you want to enter a market and you as a business need to make sure that everybody knows who you are, you might want to do what you call a blast campaign and then a, a follow-up campaign. So it could be that you have been the victim of a peak in, um, in, in communication. Uh, to a person that is maybe not really relevant. Maybe those Krasne Basanoshki were not your dream at the time. Um, so uh, the thing is the Kazakh market uh, is not extremely big online. There's not that many online re resources that are really Kazakh, as you know better than me, although I have. Uh, uh, so when you have limited inventory on mail room for the Kazakh market, etc., uh, with with very big business goals, then you get the risk that you bought all the media there is for Kazakhstan. In Russia, that's much harder, of course, with trillions of banner impressions. Now, um, I'd say that uh, I don't know this particular situation. Uh, this has been like a year ago or now. Or uh, Did you s manage to at least unsubscribe uh, everywhere, or were you also followed afterwards? Мне пришло I had to, 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 had to, uh, to research how to, to switch off it, to unsubscribe uh, this advertisement from a t particular site. And there you can at immediately see what cookies are being tracked on any site. It's Нет, дело в том, что я... No, it's just the point is not about myself. It's just about the internet community. Not nobody can do it. They are not, not of them are advanced users. Uh, they cannot uh, unsubscribe for, uh, very often from an advertisement when it is too imposing. It gets on my nerves. It's too much. I'm absolutely outstressed after that. And uh, I stop being La Moda's client after that.
that and try to find some other supplies, uh, smaller ones, so which I feel that maybe have no much money for promotion, and I would somehow um, assist uh, to their business development. So, do we need to track down these, you know, streams of the promotion because sometimes it is too much, you know, if you don't have the competitors in the country, why do you need the why, why do you have to, to spend so much money on your advertisement to just to seize the overall internet space or to be a monopolist because so it's too much, you know, and sometimes or too imposing. And um, yes, certainly there is a point of like a blast campaign. I understand what it means, but it should be you know, but when it lasts for two years, you know, a blast for two years, well isn't it uh, you know, it's absolutely unbelievable. I don't think that is professional. I think it's a very good signal for La Moda, for instance, maybe to um, was it, who used to maybe too in, too in, intensive approach, or oh, there is quite a small percentage of people for whom it was too much. Maybe yes, you should use a hashtag less La Moda and uh, see in the Twitter how people would respond to it of in a Facebook. So and then La Moda would. I will, uh, would say, so we don't want to spend too money on the publishing houses or to agencies. Uh, well, uh, maybe I'll give an additional reduction with a promo code, code Les La Mode. Or uh, what I said, when sometimes those banners who follow you, you can just, you know, click across on the right angle and uh, uh, it's okay. So just uh, for many, I don't, I, I, I'm not related to La Mode for many years, so maybe I'll be happy to help you in Kazakhstan. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, um, Look, I think from a, from a company and from a marketing perspective, what you can look at is you should very well understand how much you want to pay for a client. Um, what are your break-even times on a single customer? And, and that, in the end, should decide how much you, you will grow, right? So as long as that metric is reasonable and within your target range, I believe you should continue to invest, um, obviously looking at the marginal efficiency. Yeah? If you're just burning money at the top, obviously it doesn't make sense. but. Um, it also comes back then to, to targeting and segmentation again. So usually you have, for example, frequency caps, So which means that people would just get shown the same banner three times maximum because otherwise, you know, why would we show you the banner seven times, the same one, right? So, But what might happen is that we use different creatives, the frequency caps adds up, and in the end you will still buy, or at least the group in which you are that we're looking at analytically because you cannot look at a single customer, it's not statistically valid data, um, that that segment still performs according to our targets. And, and there, I agree, it might happen that a small percentage of people are in the end um, basically, uh, I think, over-marketed and, and would drop out, and that you see in your churn rates. So you should very well manage and, and, and view constantly your churn rates um, on advertisement as well as on CRM. And I think you will always have that situation to a certain extent um, as long as you meet your overall business goals and you constantly manage the feedback in terms of that the overall audience is fine with it, I think um, uh, you should continue to do that. Thanks for that, Niels. Okay, that's the end of our session. Thank you, Niels. Really interesting talk here and really interesting audience. So uh, I wish you a lot of fun here at the show, at the Congress. And as we saw, it started and ended with the data. So keep processing the data. Just don't leave out the humanity at, 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 the, at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you.